This is CBC Here and Now. How are you going to protect the people of my district? My people are going to be poisoned. There's some extreme messaging out there that people will be poisoned. I say to the honorable member, my fellow Labradorian, that is absolutely false. We can't ignore the fact that we're not seeing the increase in methylmercury that they forecasted and predicted in 2015. A deal is struck with two of the three Labrador indigenous groups over methylmercury. Flooding begins in two weeks, but one group is pleading to halt the flooding. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Carolyn Stokes. Sharp exchanges in the House of Assembly today over the threat of methylmercury from Muskrat Falls. And that's not all. There was also fallout from an embarrassing government oversight and for Indigenous groups in Labrador, the promise of millions. Terry Roberts breaks it all down. How are you going to protect the people of my district? My people are going to be poisoned. Strong words from a Labrador MHA about the threat of methylmercury contamination in the wild food supply downstream from Muskrat Falls. But another Labrador MHA fired back. There's some extreme messaging out there that people will be poisoned. I say to the honorable member, my fellow Labradorian, that is absolutely false, Mr. Speaker. This fireworks follow government's failure to get all three Labrador indigenous groups to sign on to a new $30 million social and health benefits agreement. The Innu Nation and the Nunatukavut Community Council have agreed to accept $10 million each to be used without conditions. But this is about some real tangible benefits that the communities could have for their members right now using this money that is now available. This was never about saving money. But the Nunatsivut government is refusing, saying the money should be spent on wetland capping in the reservoir as originally planned. It's a strategy that fizzled after the Department of Environment failed to approve a permit for Nalcor to carry out the work. Now it's too late. Flooding is set to begin August 7th. And despite the Inuit's request for a delay, the Premier says that won't happen. One of three groups of representing <coughs> 7,000 plus people, I think, is asking that you suspend the flooding. Will, the, or will you respect the request of the new Nazi food government? Well, I've got two, two groups uh, that, you know, have agreed now that they, sh they would move on. One of them groups, the Inu, of course, being the, uh, the, uh, the constitutionally, there's an agreement in place. They are, the, they are the rights holders of the land around the Muskrat Falls project area. So we just can't you know, dismiss this. It's unfortunate that we're in this situation. And we'd like to find a resolution with the Nantua government to actually get to a place where we can actually add benefits to it for all three groups. But what about those methylmercury concerns? Ball says there's a world-class monitoring system in place and early predictions that there'd be a spike in levels. Well, that never happened. The evidence right now, based on the, what we've been able to gather from those 1,300 samples, not demonstrating that there's a human health risk. If levels do increase and residents are warned against consuming country foods, there's a food security strategy in place. If there is a concern, we may have to go out and say, you cannot eat trout seven times a week, you can eat trout twice a week. That comment did not go over well with Evans. When I was doing history in school, I also remember another woman who said they can eat cake. Let them eat cake. And I got to tell you, I'm as offended as the people of, of, of France when, when that was being said to them. So what will happen to the 10 million set aside for the Inuit if they don't sign the agreement? Ball refused to answer that question today, saying he's not ready to give up. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. Keeping with the House, Dwight Ball says missing the wetland capping deadline was an oversight, but the Premier says he's not overlooking other Indigenous issues. It's been more than a year and a half since Prime Minister Justin Trudeau apologized to residential school survivors in Labrador. And back then, Ball, who doubles as the Labrador and Indigenous Affairs Minister, promised he'd say sorry on behalf of the province. But so far, no apology. Here now's Katie Breen is in our newsroom tonight. So Katie, you attended the federal apology back in 2017. What did that gesture mean to the people then? Well, it was an emotional day, and it seemed like that gesture brought some relief to survivors there. Here today to acknowledge a historic wrong. There is so much work left to be done, but now together, now together, we can start. 
That's Toby Obed on the day Canada apologized for its role in the province's residential schools. He was the lead plaintiff in a class action lawsuit that led to the settlement and the federal apology here. Obed has been waiting for Ball's apology ever since and says the fact that it hasn't happened yet is a slap in the face. He needs the Premier to apologize in order to finally feel some closure. It's been so long and to have this go ongoing and lingering, um, you know, it's enough is enough and give us the apology as it, like as you said. So sooner than later because um, the longer this goes on, the longer we have to wait and the longer we have to wonder and, you know, so please give us our apology. I also spoke with the lawyer of the class action lawsuit who says other survivors are getting angry. He says the amount of time this is taking doesn't really fit with the idea of reconciliation. Here's what Premier Dwight Ball had to say in response. Call the Indigenous groups are very much aware that I want to do this. I've made the commitment to do it. Right now it's about doing it and making sure that we meet the conditions and, and you know, the suggestions and the requirements that they want me to issue this apology on. I have no issue with doing that. I want to do it. I want to get on with it. Ball says the Department of Labrador and Indigenous Affairs is working with Indigenous groups on things like timing and location. He acknowledges that this is an emotional issue and says he wants to do the apology on survivor's terms, not his. Live in the newsroom, I'm Katie Breen for Here and Now. Well, a little rain never slowed down some of the rowers here at Kitty Vitty Lake. It's about two weeks until the regatta kicks off. And there's a lot more than just rowing going on down here. I'm Jeremy Eaton, I'm live at the lake, and I'll tell you all about it coming up after the break. And I'm gonna throw it to Ashley, so she's gonna talk a little bit about the weather, because I'm standing in the rain, and hopefully not everybody is getting wet right now. Yeah, it's uh, that rain is making its way across uh, the Avalon anywhere. We're going to see a pretty wet evening for most of eastern Newfoundland. Here's your temperatures this afternoon, though. Pretty similar to what we saw yesterday. Anywhere from uh, 16 to 23 degrees was the hot spot. Deer Lake, 19 in Happy Valley, Goose Bay. And then a little cooler for Lab City, only reaching a high near 14 degrees today. Here's that rain that uh, Jeremy was just talking about. We are seeing some lightning strikes. Right now, they're staying south of the Avalon. There is the risk that we we'll, can see some lightning as we head towards uh, the uh, late evening and overnight hours for parts of the Avalon, but I'll have all those details coming up in a little bit. The largest oil platform off the coast of Newfoundland remains shut down tonight. Ships are still trying to retrieve some of the oil, but tonight the offshore oil regulator says most of the oil can't be recovered. Here now's Peter Cowan joins us now with the details. Peter. Carolyn, let's take a look at what the oil slick looks like. And this is a picture of late last week. And since then, it's become bigger and it's become less concentrated. Now, Hibernia hasn't provided more recent images, so we can't show you what it actually looks like today. Now, we do know that they have been busy trying to collect up as much of the oil as possible from the 12,000 liters that spilled. The head of the Offshore Petroleum Board is keeping a close eye on the cleanup efforts. He says they've collected hundreds of thousands of liters of liquid, but very little of the oil will likely be retrieved. Um, until those tankers can be decanted and analyzed, we won't know for sure what the recovery rate has been. I would caution that these are not uh, highly efficient operations. Uh, recovery is complex and difficult and uh, you know a recovery ratio in the order of 20 to 25 percent would not be uh, would not be atypical. So how did the oil get out in the first place? Well that's under investigation but let me show you how they think it happened. Underneath Hibernia sits big storage tanks. They're always full. When there isn't oil in there there's water. As it fills up with oil, the water is pumped out, but they keep pumping and then a mixture of oil and water is eventually pumped out. Now a sensor is supposed to keep track and warn if oil is escaping, but clearly that system didn't work this time. This issue came up today in the House of Assembly. The minister didn't have any new information to share, but made it clear she isn't happy. This is not acceptable. 
Uh, it's unacceptable to the government of Newfoundland and Labrador. It's unacceptable to the people of Newfoundland and Labrador. It's unacceptable to industry, Mr. Speaker. Safety and environmental protection is our primary concern. Now, it's worth noting that the oil spill is costing the province. Each day the platform is shut down, it loses out in about $2.5 million in royalty money. Now, it's actually just deferred. Eventually, that oil will be pumped up and we'll get the money. But we still don't know when production will start up again. Hibernia is going to have to convince the Petroleum Board it can safely operate before that happens. Carolyn? Thanks, Peter. That's here now. Peter Cowan reporting. Well, it was tense today in a Clarenville courtroom as testimony for the impaired driving trial of Travis Firmage continued. The aunt of the victim took the stand today. Here now's Garrett Berry was in the courtroom. So, Garrett, tell us about today's testimony. Well, Carolyn, it was combative and it was very emotional. It also appeared to be a preview of the case defense lawyers are planning to make in this trial. Carol Ann Brewer took the stand this afternoon. She is the aunt of Calvin Tobin, the fisherman who died in that August 2017 crash. She took questions on phone calls she made that night, what she saw in hospital, and about the mental state of her nephew. She forcefully denied that Tobin was depressed, suffered from addiction issues, or had ever expressed suicidal thoughts. During cross-examination, she told the court and Firmage's defense lawyer, quote, my darling boy did not kill himself. Her testimony was charged and she fought through tears at several points. She said she was like a mother to Calvin Tobin. Police say Tobin was a passenger in Firmage's car and was killed as a result of the crash on the Trans-Canada Highway. RCMP have accused Firmage of driving drunk in that crash. Brewer struggled on the stand as she described not being, to be, not being allowed to hold Tobin's hand because it was too severely swollen as he lay in a hospital bed. She also testified about her family deciding to remove life support from her nephew. Court also heard this morning from the driver in the tractor trailer, the other vehicle involved in this accident. He testified the car pulled into his lane and didn't move off despite his attempts to alert the car that a collision was impending. The trial will continue tomorrow and lawyers expect to hear from expert witnesses at the RCMP Forensic Crime Lab in Ottawa. Reporting live for Here Now, I'm Garrett Barry in Clarenville. Well, anyone looking to hunt or harvest in Labrador Inuit territory will now have to pay for a permit. The new $20 fee will allow anyone who isn't a beneficiary in Nunatsiavut to harvest animals from the, the land. And that permit will also allow non-Inuit to harvest plants, which includes collecting firewood. The fee will be required in addition to any existing provincial or federal permits. That's the view from our room's camera. A little rainy out there, some heavier showers moving in just on the doorstep. Stick around though, I'll have your weather just ahead.
Welcome back, everyone. Well, before the break, you were saying that uh, the rain is just on the doorstep of uh, St. John's right now. What can we expect in the next little bit? Yeah, that's basically what we're looking at as we head through the overnight tonight. Those temperatures I showed you a little bit earlier, too, were uh, warmer, but they've dropped now. So we'll take a look at those temperatures. 16 degrees, and we can thank uh, that rain for that. 21 degrees in Gander, 20 in Corner Brook. And then uh, still sitting around 18 degrees in Happy Valley Goose Bay, a little cooler up through Nain at 8 degrees. Now, there's that rain that we were just talking about. We are seeing some lightning as well. It looks like it is tapering off for the risk of lightning is, but still going to put that uh, risk of lightning as we head through the next couple of hours as that heavier rain pushes a little bit further north. And we're going to continue to see that as we head through the night tonight. So there's uh, where I have the risk of thunderstorms. Could hear a few rumbles of thunder and there's that heavy rain as it moves through. Now towards the overnight and early morning hours, it will taper to showers, but then another round moves in uh, for the Buren Peninsula and the south coast as well. So you're looking at that and then eventually we will see a little bit of a break tomorrow afternoon. But here's a look at your temperatures overnight tonight. 14 degrees for Corner Brook, uh, 13 for Port of Basque. Those winds are generally light as we head through the night tonight. 12 degrees for Gander, 10 for St. Anthony. And then those southeasterlies uh, along, or at least for the Avalon anyway, will be pretty brisk. Anywhere from 30 to uh, 50 kilometers per hour overnight tonight up through Labrador. Still looking at that risk of some showers as well. 15, uh, 14 degrees is your overnight low for Happy Valley Goose Bay. Churchill Falls could see the risk of a few thunderstorms or at least some lightning in the next few hours and then some showers again for Lab City going down to a low near nine degrees tonight. And then for Nain, you're looking at a low near five. So tomorrow afternoon, like I said, we could see a little bit of a break in the cloud cover tomorrow. We're looking at uh, the slight chance of some afternoon showers, though, for the West Coast, generally going to stay gray up uh, for the Northern Peninsula. And then again, another round of showers moving through for the Big Land. You're looking at a generally unsettled day. And then again, we could see uh, or hear a few rumbles of thunder, even towards uh, Cartwright is where I have a risk of thunderstorms there as well. And then another round of rain will move in late day again pretty much the same track as what we're seeing tonight so uh, eastern newfoundland that's what you're looking at overnight so here's a look at your temperatures 21 degrees for uh, st john's tomorrow afternoon so pretty similar to today within a couple of degrees and then it's going to feel humid and it's going to continue to feel humid as we head towards the weekend with those temperatures bumping up as well we'll get to that in just a little bit 21 degrees for marystown 16 for bonavista Again, with that chance of showers heading towards Grand Falls, Windsor, 22 degrees, Harbor Breton, 17 anywhere along the south coast. Uh, looks like we'll see plenty of sunshine, 18 degrees for Port of Basque and then up along the west coast, Corner Brook, 22, Gross Moor, 19. And then again, staying gray for the northern peninsula, a little bit cooler, St. Anthony at 17 tomorrow. 22 for Cartwright, there's that risk of thunderstorms. And then I have that as we head towards uh, Churchill Falls as well as Lab City. Makovic could even hear a few rumbles of thunder sitting around 20 degrees as well. Nain still staying in those single digits, eight degrees, but there is a little bit of a warm up on the way, as I mentioned a little bit earlier. We'll definitely get into that. But Jeremy is lakeside tonight, and uh, I don't see a lake, but uh, it looks like you've moved inside. Well, you know, to quote the great uh, Millie Vanilli, we're going to have to blame it on the rain, Ashley, because it's too wet uh, for us to stand outside tonight. But that's not stopping the rowers. You can't see them because we're standing in front of trophies, not rowers. But there are a lot of boats out on the water. And that's because the 201st running of the Royal St. John's Regatta will happen in about two weeks. And to join us to tell us a little bit about that is the executive director of the committee, Leanne O'Neill. Leanne, thanks for taking time to speak to us. Thank you. Leanne, I noticed that it's the 201st year, but there's something different going down here at the Boathouse on Tuesday nights. Can you talk a little bit about the new program? Sure. So a couple of years ago, the Regatta Committee started talking about how we can um, make more of an effort within health and wellness. So obviously we have the physical activity piece, but we wanted to elaborate on that, and um, we got a bunch of different people involved. So. Every Tuesday we do a class, so every second Tuesday we do Roga, which is yoga for rowers, obviously, and then we do um, a lakeside hit series is every alternating Tuesday. So it's, um, yeah, it's part of the health and wellness program and it's kind of the bigger overall program. What do you mean by hit series? Like, um, like H-I-T? H, yeah, I think it's high intensity interval training and Dane Woodland is the individual that um, takes care of that, he, he teaches it, so yeah. 
So why was it important, I guess, for the committee to expand it out a little bit more and offer things like the HIV program and uh, ROGA? <laughs> well, I mean, health and wellness is huge, um, and not just the physical piece, like I said, I mean the mental health piece. So, for instance, are we, we have a Zen Zone. So that's on Regatta Day, and that's for the rowers. And inside, we've partnered with uh, Simply for Life, um, Proactive Wellness, and SAGE. So what happens is the, the rowers have the chance to kind of have a place to cool off and um, they get to just relax and get massages and stuff like that on regatta day. So it's just, it's important to us to kind of give back to the rowers. I mean, they're so, they, they're so dedicated. They, they're passionate. They're out there, like, like you just said, in the rain, like it's crazy. So um, we wanted to give back to them and kind of add on to what we already give and just have our health and wellness program. Yep. Now, people, got to, people are probably wondering, last year was a huge year for you guys, 200th mm -hmm. anniversary. It's the yeah. 201st year. Uh, what are the teams? How many teams do you have registered right now for the regatta? I believe there's about 113. Yep. And you guys happy with that amount of people? We are, yeah. Now, I know if anybody's been down by the lake, there is a lot of activity other than rowing going down there. There's a lot of construction, and I know that this is the... Uh, the $10 million, $64,000. This is the big question. Mm -hmm. uh, is everything going to be ready for Regatta Day? So we're told, yeah. <laughs> we're told. So fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. <laughs> All right. Well, we're, uh, thank you very much for your time, Leanne, telling you, tell, to tell us about this. Uh, we're going to learn a lot more about Roga coming up later on in the show. So reporting live for Here Now, I'm Jeremy Eaton in St. John's. <laughs> What's a first for St. John's City Hall? A counselor brings her newborn baby to a council meeting coming up. We'll speak with counselor Hope Jamison about motherhood and municipal politics. Oh.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, history was made right here in St. John's City Council Chambers last night, all thanks to this little one. Mom, Hope Jameson, is a counselor with St. John City Hall, and yesterday was the first time a woman has brought their baby into council chambers. You brought a little Margaret here to work. You posted the photo onto social media. What did people say about um, that? It was cool. It was really positive. It's like, it, I think we had a group of youth here actually yesterday, and they said like it was really inspiring to see that like you can actually do work like this and have small children at the same time. So that's really encouraging to me and yeah it, it was really positive positive. and how did your colleagues react oh they're they're the best they're yeah. so good yeah she got passed around <laughs> by everybody and some of the staff took her and uh, gave her a little walk when she got a little fussy like this so yeah I'm, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have colleagues who are really supportive oh that's great so why did you decide to bring Margaret to work well, I mean, she's an 11 week old breastfed infant. <laughs> I don't really have much choice. Um, I, I felt uh, an urgency to get back to work and get, get back to what we've been doing here. And of course, uh, I have to keep my child alive. So it's, uh, it's important for me to be able to do both of those things at the same time. Being a mother and a municipal politician, what, what kind of challenges are you facing? I mean, that? it's a lot of what all working parents have to deal with, isn't it? It's understanding okay, we have to take care of all the work that needs to be done and also take care of the children and make sure that you're giving them your full attention. So it's often feeling like there's not enough of you to go around. Um, like I said, I'm really lucky to have really supportive colleagues who have been kind enough to handle a lot of my constituent correspondence while I've been away having a baby. I've got a really great family who are extremely supportive as well. So all those things really make it a lot easier, but it's still a little tangly from time to time. Yeah, because as an elected official, as a municipal politician, you don't get maternity leave like a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. So how are you finding that? I mean, it's, it's tricky, of course, and I, I know that it is often uh, preferable to have more time with a, with a small infant, but we can make it work. <laughs> so in, uh, it's, it's a good test case uh, to see what might be improved in the future. Right, do you think that it should change? Should you know, they l look at your situation and change the provisions for maternity leave? Because you are the first, but you're certainly, we hope, not the last. Uh, I think if we want to see more diversity on councils and in governments generally, we need to account for things like this to make it possible for people to say, okay, I can do this and still have a life. Municipal councillors are human beings. Human beings sometimes have families. And so the more we can make those two things fit together, the, the better representation we're going to see. Yeah. And we've been seeing kind of a lot of this lately on the news. Politicians all over the world, female politicians, you know, in New Zealand and Australia, all over the place, bringing their babies into parliament and into work. Do you think that that signals kind of an attitude change that's happening globally? I hope that it does. And, and as these things gain wider acceptance, I think we'll see more and more of it. I think it's a really positive step to have more women who are in this stage of life in decision-making positions because there are things that you think about with small children that you might not necessarily if you hadn't had that experience. So like all things, the more diversity of experience we can get in around decision-making tables, the better policy we get out of the whole thing. So can we expect to see more of Margaret at City Council? Well, I'll be here in two weeks <laughs> <laughs> with baby Maggie, yeah. So uh, we'll, we'll continue that until I can be away from her for more than a couple hours at a time. Right. Well, thank you so much for speaking with us about it. Thank you. Well, keeping with politics, sort of, uh, Boris Johnson is set to become the next Prime Minister of Britain. The governing Conservatives announced today he'll replace Theresa May as party leader. Johnson is vowing to energize the country with confidence and get Brexit done. The CBC's Cameron McIntosh has more from London. Tomorrow, Boris Johnson will walk through that door, the Prime Minister of a country deeply divided. That Boris Johnson is elected as the leader of the Conservative and Unionist Party. As unlikely a Prime Minister as Boris Johnson may have once seemed, today's result wasn't much of a surprise. Johnson has long been the Conservatives' loudest, brashest Brexiteer. After Theresa May's failures to get a deal passed, his insistence on leaving deal or not by October 31st resonated. We're going to get Brexit done on October 31st. We're going to take advantage of all the opportunities that it will bring in a new spirit of can-do. As he spoke, outside, Plenty of this. We demand a people's vote. Calls to hold an election before proceeding with Brexit. Boris Johnson, not fit for public office.
0.3% of the population get a say in who the Prime Minister is. How is that democratic? But also support from the heavily conservative Leave side. He is courageous. OK, he has um, a, 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 his own style, um, but he is somebody who wants to leave the European Union. I'm convinced of that. Opposition leader Jeremy Corbyn tweeted this call for an election, vowing he'll call for a vote of non-confidence. Meanwhile, Johnson faces challenges within his own party. Several key ministers have resigned. Not everyone in his government is confident in potentially crashing out of the European Union. There is a clear majority in the House of Commons that doesn't want to leave the EU without a deal. I have always had grave concerns about leaving the EU without a deal in place. His opponent, Jeremy Hunt, called for the party to come together. It's going to be very challenging, but he has got the confidence and the optimism and the energy to get us through this. And today... Today, a newspaper wrote, Johnson faces the most daunting challenges of any modern incoming prime minister. Well, I look at you this morning and I ask myself, do you look daunted? Do you feel daunted? Johnson is talking about a new age of British confidence, although his plans are lacking details, at least publicly, Regardless, tomorrow he'll meet with the Queen and accept what he's long coveted, the keys to that door. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, London. Hanging out in the Royal St. John's Regatta Museum, but we're going to do something a little bit newer than some of these black and white photos. I'm going to tell you all about Roga, what it is and how I can't do it. That story coming up after the break. Let's head back down to the boathouse at Kitty Vitty Lake. Jeremy is there live. So, Jeremy, tell us about this uh, Roga event that you mentioned uh, earlier. I guess it's kind of like yoga. Uh, so you take rowing, and then you take yoga, and then you mash them together, and you get something called Roga. So I, I thought it was made up at first, but it is a real thing. Okay. And, uh, but uh, I don't know much about it, but I know who does know about it. That's, so we're seated on the floor because uh, 
I'm not even sure why we're sitting on the floor, but just something a little bit different. But this is Laura Beth Power, and she is a well-known yoga instructor. You're also a rower, and she will be teaching the yoga class. Thanks for joining us, Laura Beth. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. So, how do you combine rowing and yoga? Well, it's a yoga class for rowers, <laughs> and I guess just the play on words, um, putting them together to make yoga. Uh, I'll do a focus on shoulder stretching, core strengthening, and hip flexor, mo like hip mobility. Um, on the lake, rowers take like a big, you know, big pounding on their body, uh, doing all the conditioning and training for the big race. So this is a nice cross-training exercise to help with mental focus and also physical um, endurance and recovery. So you, as I said, you're a yoga instructor, but you are also a rower. Like, so are there any sort of certain, like you teach a yoga class, you're going to teach a rower class. Is it any different, the two, or do you do, as you said, I guess there's certain specific exercises. But will you do anything different tonight with the rowers to help them out? Um, I'll definitely put a focus on certain areas of the body that I know as a rower that take a lot of stress, the upper middle back, uh, around the ribs, so like side stretches are always really good for rowers, and a lot of core strength. All those, um, the whole uh, mechanics of the actual pull through the water takes a lot of core, so kind of turning up those muscles on and conditioning the body for a good race. Now, normally, we're seated inside of the museum. We're supposed to be outside, but it's pouring rain, so we don't have that beautiful beautiful backdrop and I, I know that unfortunately yeah because it would be would be a great view but are you expecting a big turnout tonight or yeah hopefully there's it's a complimentary class uh, powered by Lululemon and the regatta committee so it's been happening all summer long bi-weekly up until the regatta which is only a few weeks away now so I, uh, I wanted, I, I'm trying to figure out how I can make my stupid joke, but the joke was, is I'm not very good at the downward dog, I'd rather eat hot dogs, so I just had to get that, that in somewhere. Uh, and how long does the class run, Laura Beth? The class will be 60 minutes, so we'll start around 7 p.m. and finish up at 8. So the class starts, as she said, at 7, so there's lots of rowers on the water, probably going to make their way in here, get a good workout with you, and then, uh, and then go home tired. So... Uh, Anyways, appreciate your time. Thanks so much, Laura Beth. Thank you very much, Jeremy. And uh, so that's it. I'm not going to do any yoga because it's embarrassing. See how nice her posture is compared <laughs> to me? Slobbyingly sitting, yeah, slobby, slobbily sitting down. So Anyways. we're, uh, Carolyn, Jeremy. I don't know about. We're, we're not going to see you in yoga pants anytime soon, I assume then. I don't think anybody would want to see me wear yoga pants, that's for sure. <laughs> Anyways, but uh, we're going to leave, let Laura Beth get ready to teach this class, and we're going to throw it back to you guys in the studio. All right, thanks so much, Jeremy. Well, people aboard a whale-watching boat off Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, got an added thrill yesterday. Yes, they saw whales, but they also watched as the captain and his crewmate embarked on a rescue mission. Colleen Jones has that story. Tourists snap pictures of the birds and seals. Captain Walter Flower saw the signature blow of a humpback whale. He steered his whale watching boat in that direction. Yeah. What he saw, a humpback in distress. Right there. When we came up clo pretty close to it, I could see that it had gear on it. You know, a rope and a buoy trail behind it. He phoned the whale rescue people and they told him DFO would be there by dusk. And he thought that would be too late and that in this vast ocean, they might never find what he found. He knew one thing, he couldn't leave this massive humpback without trying to free it. It took some MacGyvering. I said, I wish I had a grapple on board, which is a, a grappling hook you can throw to, to retrieve things. And, uh, and we didn't have one on the boat. We had our, our, our uh, mooring hook uh, that we used uh, back in our first stern line on the boat, and which uh, actually turned out to be like the perfect tool for, what, you know, for, for hooking the line. We went up and f just picked up on the whale again, and. Uh, we're steaming along just behind it. The, the buoy was about 35 feet, 40 feet behind the whale. The skipper decided, you know, we're here. We got to try to do something. And that's, that's where it came from. He said, we got to try to do something. Yeah, and ahead of it, and ahead of it. Because the, the whale will bring it right down, right? I'll tell you when to throw it. His crewmate, Kevin Dares, was on the bow. A first time at a whale rescue for both of them. And uh, went up the bow, tied it off on the bow up there. You were up on the bow. Well, yeah, I was up there. But he tied it off. On, he tied it off on the hook there, and uh, and uh, so what we done then? Walter well, got the boat up close to the up close to the whale there, and we threw the line back over 
we're the ahead of the buoy. So, so we're in order for it to, to slide back on the line to hook and uh, to hook around the line to, to, to grab onto it. Pull it off him. Like grapple it, you know? Damn. Oh. After many tries, success. But uh, after about the tenth try, uh, Kevin, Kevin got it, and it was uh, it was uh, hooked up, you know, fish on. So we uh, we were uh, ready for the Nantucket sleigh ride, as they say. So. <laughs> what does that mean, the Nantucket well, sleigh ride? Uh, Nantucket sleigh ride is what when the old whalers when they they'd harpoon a whale in their whaleboats and they'd hang on for dear life, and the whale would take off, and they had a bit in the bow of the boat. A good sign was that when he was freed. He did leave. He took off. He went. He went. He was going offshore, wow. and he was he was moving along pretty good. The tangled mess of rope in the buoy has been brought to the dock for DFO, but this ghost gear is hard on all marine life, especially whales. Been a lot of tragedy with whales over this last little while, and so even just to be, you know, be able to get that off of that guy was kind of a a good feeling. When they freed the humpback whale, the tourists on board all cheered. This is one whale watching adventure they'll never forget. Colleen Jones, CBC News, off Cross Island. Well, heading out west now where the case of a young couple murdered in northern British Columbia took a stunning turn today. The RCMP says two young men who were initially reported missing are now considered suspects. The teens are also accused of killing another man whose body was found near their abandoned burnt out camper. The CBC's Renee Filipponi has more. These are images of the pair captured on surveillance video recently. 19-year-old Cam McLeod and 18-year-old Briar Schmigelski were spotted in Saskatchewan and are now the focus of a national manhunt. Given these latest developments, Cam and Briar are no longer considered missing. The RCMP are now considering Cam McLeod and Briar Schmigelski as suspects in the Dees Lake suspicious death and the double homicide of Lucas Fowler and China Dees. These are some of the final moments for Australian Lucas Fowler and American China Dees. Security video from a gas station. The couple were on a road trip when they were shot and killed south of Laird Hot Springs. Their van was found not far from their bodies along the Alaska Highway in northeast BC. About 500 kilometers away, further west near Dees Lake, another body. This unknown man was found dead at a pullout on the highway. A truck was burning not far away a truck driven by McLeod and Schmigelski. Friends say the pair from Port Alberni were headed to Whitehorse to look for work. For days they were listed as missing and communities in northern BC had been on edge, worried about a potential killer on the loose. Everything changed when the pair was spotted yesterday. At today's news conference, the RCMP were pressed on why it took so long to notify the public. This is a fast moving investigation and uh, w is compounded by several factors, which include the vastness of the North, the individual, the fact that individuals have made some effort to, to move out of jurisdictions. All those things contribute to our ability to quickly uh, identify additional information or additional facts. RCMP have contacted police across the country in an effort to locate the teens. They are considered armed and dangerous, and the public are being warned not to approach them, but if they spot the pair, to call 911 immediately. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Vancouver.
my number one etiquette rule is that if you're inviting people to a bridal shower, they should only be the ones who are invited to your wedding. But if you belong to a women's group or a church group, you're more than welcome to invite those ladies as they are there to help you through all that you're going through getting ready for your wedding. And they've been part of your life for such a long time. Do get to know your officiant. This is the person that is going to conduct your very special ceremony. So it should be someone that you're comfortable with. Get together for an informal cup of coffee or for couples living away, you can maybe have a video chat. This will help you to build a ceremony that is comfortable for you and for your guests. And if you've been invited to somebody's wedding, please make sure to show up for the ceremony if at all possible. Please do not arrive late for the ceremony. You've had ample time to get ready and it's best for you to arrive 10 to 15 minutes ahead of the ceremony time. When that bride walks down the aisle, she may ask for the doors to be closed and no one to enter. Please don't stock up on drinks when your cocktail hour is free. Your drinks will get watered down, they'll get warm, you might not even drink half of them. However, your bride and groom still have to pay for them. Please remember to RSVP on time. The bride and groom have enough on their plate. They don't need to be hunting you down. And family and friends, no matter how close you are, they need your RSVP. Do make sure you unplug. More than likely, you're going to hire a photographer to capture your special day. Make sure your officiant asks all guests to put away their phones and cameras before the ceremony begins. Even if you make a small misstep, your wedding will be just as beautiful as the way you planned it. And in the end, the most important part is you're going to spend the rest of your life with your spouse-to-be. Some good tips there for people who are heading off to weddings. And I just heard that the two people that are uh, that were speaking in that video, they're married to each other. So they're a couple. So interesting. <laughs> just a little fun fact there for Absolutely. you. Absolutely. <laughs> so do you have lots of uh, weddings this summer? Uh, four. Four? I had four weddings. I couldn't make all of them. But yeah, four weddings. Four people that I know are getting married. It's busy season. Well, I mean, I guess it's my age. But yeah. Yeah. And it all depends on the weather for, for some <laughs> folks, especially the ones that are getting married outside. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So uh, at least you're not get, hopefully not getting married on a Tuesday night because uh, not very nice out there. <laughs> yeah. But uh, we'll take a look at the forecast quickly tomorrow afternoon. Uh, we're looking at temperatures a little bit warmer than what we're seeing today, just in case you missed that forecast uh, a little bit earlier. But again, uh, looking at a little bit of a break in the weather tomorrow afternoon, we could see a few peaks of sun specifically mainly for eastern Newfoundland and uh, the Avalon as well. And then up through Labrador, we're still looking at that risk of some thunderstorms through the day. So here's a look at uh, what's happening as far as systems go. So we've got a number of low pressure systems in play. And that's going to bring us our weather over the next couple of days. So that one low is going to move in tonight, the next one behind it. And then there's another one in behind that as well. But with this, it's also going to bring some warmer temperatures. And we can think um, a ridge of high pressure off the east coast or rather uh, towards the west and then off uh, to the south there. And that's keeping that track in these low pressure systems essentially trained after one another. But uh, again, with that, we're going to see a warm up and that's as we head towards the weekend. Significant warm up on the way. It does look like temperatures into the 20 high 20s for parts of Labrador and then parts of Central as well. So heading towards Thursday, those temperatures are going to start to jump up though. 20 to 25 degrees for Central's at Grand Falls, Windsor. Uh, a little bit cooler for St. John's, only reaching around 17 degrees as that low pressure system moves in. 22 up through Happy Valley, Goose Bay, and then uh, Lab City sitting around 18 degrees. And then as I mentioned, towards the weekend, that's when we really start to see that warm up. And with that, it's actually going to be quite nice. We should see plenty of sunshine, not a whole lot happening uh, as far as weather goes. Maybe a few cloudy periods uh, for the island. Other than that, up, most of the action will be up through Labrador. So we're looking at uh, some rain as a couple of low pressure systems head a little bit further north. By Sunday, we'll start to see some uh, more cloud cover move in and potentially some showers as well with that, but that's still a few days out. But anyway, definitely looking at these uh, warmer temperatures as we head towards the weekend. So here's what it's looking like. Uh, that number on Friday should be 22 degrees, not two degrees. Don't worry about that. Uh, 23 on Saturday and then Sunday looking at uh, 21 degrees as the afternoon high. But yeah, again, plenty of sunshine. It looks like as of now 
for uh, central Newfoundland. High 20s and humid uh, could even reach 29, 30 degrees. Kept it at 28 right now for Saturday, uh, but beautiful uh, and hot as we head towards the weekend. And then same thing for western Newfoundland. A little bit cooler, anywhere from 25 to 27 degrees. Those overnight lows in the high teens as well. And then uh, for eastern Labrador, 21 degrees tomorrow, 22 on Thursday, and then 28 on Saturday. But again, that potential for some showers both Saturday and Sunday. And we're going to see a similar forecast for western Labrador. Uh, 17, 18 degrees to start uh, or head, sorry, rather headed towards the weekend and then into those high 20s for the rest of the weekend. So let's look at your forecast. I'll have your weather photo coming up. Thanks, Ashley. Well, earlier, Jeremy talked about downward dogs and hot dogs, and in Ottawa, swimming lessons have gone to the dogs. This summer, one facility is teaching pups everything from basic swimming skills to doggy diving with a full sign-up sheet. It's fair to say the new business is making a splash. CBC's Robin Miller swung by. It's like a water park for dogs. A place that takes the doggy paddle to a whole new level. It's only Meg's second time here. Her owners heard about the lessons online and enrolled right away. Because Meg is a very high energy dog, <laughs> and uh, which is probably typical of all Goldens, and uh, I just needed something to keep her occupied. Go! Meg wears a life jacket to boost her confidence because not all dogs are naturals in the water. Some dogs just aren't built for it, um, like little French bulldogs, they actually sink like a rock. So you have to teach them how to swim and we start them with a life jacket. Ready, up. Mary Spurl says the pool is booked solid for the summer, with some clients coming from as far as Montreal. She says about half her customers are training their dogs to compete in dog diving and the others are there just for fun. I like seeing dogs off the couch. I like seeing dogs have fun and do activities. Dog owners say the pool is the perfect place to cool off and exercise their dogs in the heat of summer. <laughs> the pool is available to rent by the hour or half hour but your dog has to complete a private swimming lesson first. They go crazy. They're, like my standard, one of them in the, is in the crate and she's shivering. Not because she's cold, because she wants to get back in the water. <laughs> they just love it. Robin Miller, CBC News, Renfrew. And I want to know where you're to this summer season. Dale Hodder sent us this photo. Take a guess. I'll tell you where he's to right after the break.
Welcome back, everyone. Just enough time to have a look at this lovely weather photo. It's a beauty. Take a look at that photo. This photo was taken in Portugal Cove. Ah, huh. yes. And it, uh, it was after an evening of fishing. So beautiful sunset there. Thank you. Uh, so much to Dale Hodder to, uh, for sending us that photo. And if you have any that you'd like to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. We're getting lots of uh, fishing photos. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. And speaking of Portugal Cove St. Phillips, that's where Jeremy is going to be uh, tomorrow night for the Killick Games. So he is definitely a man on the move Absolutely. the past few weeks. So <laughs> be sure to tune in tomorrow and check him out in Portugal Cove St. Phillips. That's it for us tonight, and uh, we're going to leave you on a shot outside, a live look outdoors. See, oh, yeah. A little rainy. A little rainy. No barbecuing tonight. Nope. <laughs> Dogs may not want to head out. That's where my mind always goes. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Good night.